Hello, I'm John McGovern and today I'm going to be talking about Act 3 of Hamlet. If you remember from the previous video, I was talking about Act 2 of Hamlet and in that act, King Claudius had commissioned two of Hamlet's so-called friends, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, to spy on the prince, but they had been unsuccessful in extracting any information. And so, at the start of Act 3, King Claudius and Lord Polonius realised that they need to try a new, a new kind of method. So they decide to spy on Hamlet themselves to find out if his madness is really caused by lovesickness or whether there is something else at play here. While King Claudius and Polonius are spying on Hamlet, the prince launches into his famous third soliloquy. That's the to be or not to be soliloquy. And it's worth playing this clip in full. And if, if, you, if you've already seen the to be or not to be soliloquy a hundred times, you might want to skip forwards a few minutes uh, to go straight to the analysis. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them to die, to sleep no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come? When we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, a proud man's contumely. The pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bumpkin. Who would Bartles bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life? But that the dread of something after death undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of thus conscience doth make cowards of us all and thus the native hue of resolution is sickly o'er with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action and in in discussing uh, this soliloquy th there is a danger of being reductionist there's a danger of um, oversimplifying uh, the complexity of the speech uh, to, to give an example in 1877, the American scholar Horace Howard Furness published a variorum edition of Hamlet, that is, an edition of the play with the text and then with comments from various critics. And as you can see on the screen, uh, the comments from various leading critics of, of, of the 19th century and prior to that uh, take up more space than the poem itself. And that was in 1877, so since then there has been a vast, vast amount of, uh, of comment on this soliloquy. 
Um, so with those warnings in mind, we, we can talk about some of the key uh, features of this speech. So broadly speaking, it's, it's a speech about suicide. So the prince is reflecting on the, na the nature of life and the nature of death. And, and if, if somebody has an extremely difficult life, wouldn't it be better for them to, to end it all? And I'd say that's the main, uh, the main theme of, of the soliloquy. The prince considers whether suicide could be considered to be an act of heroism. He describes it as taking arms against a sea of troubles, or in other words, arming yourself against a sea of troubles or an ocean of troubles. And this is a catechesis or more commonly a mixed metaphor. And mixed metaphors are in, in many cases considered to be poetic faults, but this famous example in, in, the, in the third soliloquy is actually uh, is famously successful. And to describe some of the other uh, phrases in the soliloquy briefly, uh, to die to sleep, uh, this is easy to, to misinterpret. Uh, to, to die to sleep is a, is a terse, early modern commonplace or proverb. So um, it's really, a, you could think about it as an abbreviated form of the phrase, to die is to sleep. So the phrase to die to sleep means to die is simply to sleep. Uh, one of the other famous phrases in this solilo soliloquy is uh, to shuffle off this mortal coil. So a way of describing death, death, um, to shuttle off this mortal coil. And a coil was, um, it, it could mean chaos or, or, or simply hustle and bustle. So, and, and to shuffle off was to, it's not really, it's not really about shuffling uh, physically. It's more about uh, sort of uh, leaving behind. So it's about, so to shuffle off this mortal coil means to leave behind the hustle and bustle or, or perhaps the chaos of the present world. And, and finally, to find peace. Hamlet also says that a human being might his creators make with a bare bodkin. So a bodkin was a dagger. So um, he might, instead of suffering the, the tremendous uh, problems and dangers in life, he could simply end it with a, with a dagger. And a quietus is a piece of accounting jargon from the period. So for example, if you owed money to the king and you went to pay the king, uh, you would receive a piece of parchment from the Department of the Exchequer, which at the bottom would say quietus est, a bit of Latin, which means that he is quit. So you, you pay the debt that you owed the king and you are quit. And I believe uh, the phrase quietus est, it, it, it started in the exchequer, um, but it also, it ended up becoming quite common in, in other kinds of accounting, for example, business accounting. The prince's to be or not to be soliloquy is, is so famous, in fact, that some critics have expressed annoyance about it. It's almost too familiar uh, that, that they can't appreciate it anymore. And this, this is the sentiment expressed by Charles Lamb, the celebrated critic. Uh, who wrote in, in 1811 uh, in an essay called On the Tragedies of Shakespeare, this comment. I confess myself utterly unable to appreciate that celebrated soliloquy in Hamlet beginning to be or not to be, or to tell whether it be good, bad or indifferent. It has been so handled and poured about by declamatory boys and men, and torn so inhumanly from its living place and principle of continuity in the play, till it has become to me the perfect dead member. So, so an interesting comment here um, in the way it reflects on the extent to which you can extract poetry from Shakespeare's plays and, and whether they can, they can still sort of be self-sustaining as, as a poetic artifact. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of trouble and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more. There, there is, there's an anthology of Shakespeare's verse by, by Ted Hughes, for example, and, and Ted Hughes takes bits out of the plays and presents them on the page almost as if they are, are lyric poetry. Um, so it's interesting to think about um, whether or not that's a, that can be a successful procedure. After the soliloquy is finished, Ophelia enters and Hamlet rebuffs her and tells her he never really loved her and famously instructs her to go to a nunnery. 
And Claudius and Polonius, who, who are watching, realise that Hamlet's madness isn't motivated by love sickness at all. There's something much more, there's something much deeper going on. Scene two of Act Three is the play within the play, um, alternat alternatively called the murder of Gonzago or the mouse trap. And as I described before, this is a play which Hamlet puts on um, to illustrate the, the murder, to allegorize the murder of the death of old Hamlet. And the idea is that when Claudius sees the play, he, he, will, he will be touched with a pang of guilt and it will, it will motivate him to, to, confess, uh, what, to confess the murder of old Hamlet. As, as Hamlet said in the previous act, I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have, have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. And in this act, it seems to work. The king does react guiltily. Uh, he stands up and asks for light. He poisons him in the garden for his estate. His name's Gonzago. The story is extant and written in very choice Italian. You shall see a nun. How the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife! The king rises. What? Frighted with false fire. As far as Hamlet is concerned, this confirms the king's guilt beyond doubt. As he says, I'll take the ghost's words for a thousand pound. Claudius realises that he's going to have to take drastic measures against the prince. So he decides to send Hamlet to England uh, with secret letters, commanding the King of England to kill him. Then comes Claudius's soliloquy, where he discusses with himself uh, whether repentance is possible. And he comes to the conclusion that he can't repent because he is, he is still king. So he is still benefiting from the fruits of his sin. He says, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder. That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder, my crown, my own ambition, and my queen. And Claudius then kneels to pray, and Hamlet enters the room, unseen by Claudius. And he has the chance to kill the king, but he hesitates. And the reason he gives is, um, if, I, if I killed the king while he is praying, then he's, he's, he uses the word seasoned, then he, he's too prepared, he's too seasoned uh, for his death. And it might be that uh, he's forgiven after praying and ends up going to heaven. And, and, and what kind of revenge is that? Um, he killed my father, as, as far as Hamlet is concerned. He killed, Claudius killed my father when, when, when he was still in a state of sin without chance to prepare. So if I, if I um, take revenge by killing Claudius while he is praying, then uh, it, it's, it's unequal, it's unfair. There are various reasons as to why Hamlet hesitates so often. When he gets the chance to take revenge, why does he, why does he, why does he always procrastinate or hesitate? Um, and I found an interesting explanation by Hazelton Spencer, uh, writing in a journal called The Review of English Studies in 1933. And he wrote that, one way of interpreting Hamlet's repeated delays is, and, and this is where the quote starts, to revert to the blunt common sense of the 18th century, which recognised that the fundamental reason for the delayed revenge is that once Claudius is stabbed, la commedia è finita, so, um, or that the play is finished. So, so uh, sort of a witty um, sort of uh, common sense explanation here. And of course, you can make, make up your own mind as to why Hamlet uh, constantly delays. Scene four is set in the Queen's closet. Uh, so Queen Gertrude has sent for Hamlet and he, he obeys her summons and Polonius is hiding behind a curtain. It's called, it's called the arras in the stage directions and this was probably a, a curtain which hung at the back of the stage in a, in a theatre such as the Globe and behind the curtain there was a, a little alcove um, which is often called the, the discovery space. So Polonius is hiding behind this curtain in the in the discovery space and Hamlet enters the closet and confronts his mother. He says he's going to set up a mirror in which she can see the inmost part of herself, her inmost faults. And Gertrude, the queen, screams for help and Polonius, who is hiding behind the curtain, also cries for help. And Hamlet panics. He thinks the king is behind the curtain and stabs him through the arras. 
Um, but of course, when they move the curtain back, he realizes that he hasn't killed the king at all. He's killed uh, Polonius and he doesn't really show remorse for his actions. He just calls Polonius an old fool for, for having come in the way. Act three ends with the death of Polonius. And of course, this sets the foundation for the climax, which, which, which is, is shortly uh, to begin. And that's something which we, we will discuss in the next couple of episodes. So thank you for watching again, and I hope to see you again in a future video. If you like this content, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe because um, it will help to support our work and, and ensure that we can keep on making content like this.